So, okay. Um, so now we have um, Sunakshi Srivastava, um, and she is doing her MPhil. Um, she's an MPhil candidate um, in at Indra Prastha University, um, and she graduated from the University of Delhi in 2020. And her research focuses on speculative fictions and food futures. Um, she was shortlisted for the Food Lab Residency with the Serendipity Arts Foundation. Um, she's also a regular contributor to the food column in En Route um, India History. She also has published pieces um, in the Folger Library blog, um, the Modernist Review, and the Cambridge Journal of Anthropology. And today she will present her research um, entitled a, a Pinch of Salt, Salt, Bonds, and Nation Making in Modern India. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll start my uh, screen sharing. Uh, please let me know if it's visible. Yeah. So uh, my presentation titled A Pinch of Salt, Salt, Bonds and Nation Making in Modern India, considers salt an exalted commodity as an excess of contested power struggles. I consider Murgaraj Anand's Across the Black Waters and Prem Chand's Namakka Daroga or The Salt Inspector as my key texts to investigate how salt fueled ideas of fidelity, betrayal, class, caste and racial struggles by briefly referencing Gandhi's salt satyagraha and how it con continues to haunt our cultural memory. Is the screen visible? Okay, uh, yes, yeah. we can see it, yeah. Anthropologist Mary Douglas treats food as a code that is capable of expressing social relationships. And this code, if unraveled, conveys a message about different degrees of hierarchy, inclusion and exclusion, boundaries and transactions across the boundaries. Food preference eschews neutrality. We routinely use food to express relationships between different aspects of ourselves with one another and with the environment. The obtaining and consuming of food is a statement of shared ideology. Universally, salt is, a, salt is symbolic of loyalty and fidelity. In Leonardo da Vinci's classic rendition of The Last Supper, Judas overturns and spills the salt from its cellar, foreshadowing his eventual betrayal to Jesus. In the Indian imagination, regional proverbs equate loyalty and gratitude with salt. The Hindustani proverb, Namak Haram, offender of salt, refers to a betrayer. One such proverb in circulation elucidates that when two people made an agreement, they would do so by throwing a pinch of salt in water and swear to abide by the promise, failing which they may perish and vanish as salt does in water. Salt took upon uh, political implications during the 1930s when Mahatma Gandhi undertook the Dandi March. The march, sometimes referred to as the Salt Satyagraha or Salt Walk, was a non-violent protest against the tax levied on salt by the British government. Months before the Satyagraha, Congress had adopted Poon Swaraj complete independence as their goal. Gandhi believed the salt tax to be the most inhuman poor tax that ingenuity of man can devise, since next to air and water, salt is perhaps the greatest necessity of life. The protest can be understood as a subversive act against the ruling authority by ironically employing salt, the very symbol of loyalty and gratitude. Salt has a checkered past in Indian history. An essential commodity, it was brought under heavy taxation by the East India Company in 1780. Hastings brought salt manufacture under government control. Gandhi's decision to revolt against the salt tax, uh, salt tax was twofold. Revolt against tons, uh, taxation on a commodity necessary for basic survival, as well as to infuse vigor amongst the Indians against a foreign power that was appropriating and taxing them for their own resources. Nico Slate in Gandhi's search for the perfect diet writes, soon after he returned to India from South Africa, 
Gandhi witnessed firsthand the impact of the salt tax on the rural poor. In Champaran, a remote region of Northeast India, he saw how the tax artificially raised the price of salt and made it most difficult to procure salt at a reasonable price. To the average farmer, salt was as necessary as water and air. Six months before he visited Champaran, Gandhi had still been on his saltless diet. His experience working with India's poor led him to accept salt's necessity. In a striking departure, he began to link salt to national identity, encouraging his fellow Indians to be true to our salt, true to our nation. Salt became the nation's vital necessity. The poor were the salt of India, and nonviolent activists were the salt of the earth. Historian Richard M. Eaton maps a cultural genealogy of being bound by salt, tracing it back to the ancient Mesopotamian world. Salt came to express, and I quote, notions of protection and dependency that operated simultaneously at social, political, and superhuman level in high Perso Islamic culture, gaining currency in Hindustan during the Mughal era. Set amidst the backdrop of World War I, Mulkraj Anand's Across the Black Waters highlights the anxiety of Indian soldiers who arrive in Nasir after having risked the dreaded Kala Pani, which are black waters rumored to bring bad luck upon anyone who dares to cross them. A series of salty gastrocentric metaphors and imageries abound in the text to pronounce brimming tensions and ideas of servitude between the soldiers and the Sarkar, their English master. The gastronomic medium serves as a conduit for including and excluding members within and from society. For example, when Padre Sahib, a priest, discusses the merits of Christianity, a Baluchi remarks that Muslims and Christians are cousins, while a pious Gurkha Hindu remarks that their only drawback is that they eat beef. Moreover, upon their arrival in France, Uncle Kirpu, a sepoy, cannot behold the sight of the carcasses of cows and goats hanging down from hooks in butcher's shop and wonders how Frenchmen can eat these. This anxiety is diminished to some extent when an exchange of sweets between a French child and a sepoy establishes a complete understanding between the East and the West. The Indian sepoys also endure a cultural shock in France when they witness the ease with which the French interact with the English and the Hindustanis, temporarily dissolving racial and caste hierarchies. Despite such gastrocentric dissimilarities, what binds them all together is salt. In the Indian context, salt figures as an essential commodity, so much so that it can be enumerated as the fourth basic need, in addition to the triad of roti, kapra, or makan, which translate to bread, cloth, and house. Salt is an exalted essential commodity and represents an exodus of contested power struggle, which can be seen in the novel. Following orders from the Sarkar, the sepoys know nothing about the cause or the reason for the conflict or the new land of Marseilles they find themselves in. It is an enigma that they are bound to out of the duty to their British masters, catalyzed by the message sent by the emperor king, reminding them of their personal devotion to his throne. This vague notion of dharm, duty, necessary for their razi khushi, well-being, is iterated throughout the novel by employing the metaphor of the salt of the sarkar. It is precisely this notion of protection and dependency that allows the metaphor of the salt to maintain and demand a hierarchy within and among the soldiers and the officers in the novel, sustaining a rigid order horizontally and vertically. The conviction that where the sarkar goes, Huzur, we have to follow like good disciples, is edged deep in the psyche of the sepoys. There is no space to breathe a whisper of discontent since they have eaten the salt of the sarkar. For instance, during the train journey from Orleans, when Uncle Kirpu complains about the cramped train, the lance corporal, Loknath, rebukes him for whining, declaring that, though, and I quote, some of us eat the salt of the sarkar, we are not even prepared to do a little fatigue for it. 
the inextricable notion of duty and obedience that binds the sepoys to the English masters is also embedded in the matrix of familial references. Loknath recreates the image of an English officer as just father mother looking after the troops with a devoted and fatherly care. And when Padre Sahib visits the sepoys, he too delineates a patrilineal fidelity for the sepoys to adhere to, clubbing together God, Father, and the Sarkar. This similar sentiment is expressed by the old sepoy, Daddy Dhanno. The Sarkar and the Almighty are interchangeable for him, validating his obedience to the Sarkar, whose salt he had eaten. For Daddy Dhanno, to obey the Sarkar is the highest dharma. And Uncle Kirkwood declares right before the night of the war that they must remain faithful to the ethos of their grandfathers who had remained true to the salt of the Sarkar by fighting loyally and dying nobly. Ironically, Kirkwood dies by suicide after being wrongly accused and punished for betraying the salt for his benefits. The protagonist Lalu struggles to reconcile his personal beliefs with the performativity of public service. He begins to understand that the cause of the war was the assassination in Saravio, but Daddy Dhanu of blessed memory used to say, we've eaten the salt of the Sarkar. He announces this to his comrades only to confuse them further since they believe it easier to couch their faith in a fixed matrix, that of Namak Halal or being faithful to the salt. The ideology of salt is so finely ingrained that it damages the identity of the sepoys by feeding the idol of hierarchy and limiting descent. The sepoys get at each other's throats to defend the sanctity of the Sarkar. So Vidar Suchet Singh shoots Hanumant Singh because he refuses to fight for this dirty Sarkar. Uncle Kirpo alludes to the relationship between Sarkar and the sepoys by compa uh, comparing the latter to dogs hinting at the idea of wafadari or fidelity. Through the contested moral model of staying true to one's salt, Anand highlights the exploitation of the sepoys at the hands of the Sarkar. Since they fear going against the grain, they are ready to accept their destiny, ready to embrace Farishtabad, the city of angels, ready to die while fighting for the Sarkar. The idea of staying true to the salt, one's duty or dharm, finds further resonance in the didactic prose of Prem Chand's The Salt Inspector. A brand new salt department is created to prevent people from using the God-given bounty freely, much coveted, the position and the commodity. People, however, soon give into smuggling salt and the period comes to be char uh, characterized by embezzlement, greed and malpractice. Uh, the logic and symbolism of fidelity which hinges upon salt is upturned when a conflict plays out between Pandit Alokdin and Munshi Vanshidhar. Munshi Vanshidhar, as the inspector of salt, adheres to his dutifulness and integrity, refusing to provide any leverage to corrupt dealings or extra income. Munshi Vanshidhar arrests Pandit Alokdin for smuggling salt, uh, carts of salt crystals from the department storehouse. While Pandit Alokdin epitomizes corruption that is seeped through the moral fabric of society, reaffirming the truth and justice a mere toys in the hands of wealth and can be manipulated as one wants, Munshi Vanshidha refuses to be strayed from the path of duty. While he is warned against overreaching his position and social station by attempting to arrest a Brahmin, the Munshi refuses to budge from his dharm as a salt inspector refusing the pundit's bait of, uh, bait of bribe. In the strained tug of war between duty and wealth, duty wins, Vanshidhar stays true to the ethos of his profession and by extension his salt. However, since the pundit is a man of sizable influence, he is soon acquitted of his crime of smuggling salt and let free. This event draws, uh, dawns upon Vanshidhar the realization that in the times of moral corruption, Justice, learning, and high sounding titles deserve no respect. Vanshidhar is dismissed from his position as a salt inspector, ironically, because despite staying true to his job, he had not stayed true to the demands of society. 
In a turn of events, however, he is appointed as the general attorney for the Pandit's property. The reason that caused his fall from his position as an inspector becomes the reason for his installment as the attorney general. Uh, while the instatement might come across as a fair, fairy tale end to Vanshidhar's misfortunes, the logic behind his appointment as attorney general in, is his characteristic willingness to sacrifice everything on a matter of principle. His appointment pivots on the very idea of wafadari, of fidelity, allowing Pandit Alokuddin to maintain his position in the so social circle by being his faithful servant. Thus, salt and the associated idea of fidelity proliferates both the texts, functioning as a material metaphor for the circulation and maintenance of social hierarchies. Obligations and duties mandate a politics of being in debt, a necessity of paying back or staying in servitude, buttressed by continuous emphasis on salt and the conviction of namak halal in cultural memory. Talking about cultural memory, Tata Salt was launched in 1983 as India's first branded salt. The tagline Desh Ka Namak, meaning the salt of the country harps back to the cultural connotation of Namak Halal, Vafadari, and the salt Satyagraha. Uh, these are direct uh, snapshots from uh, Tata's uh, website, which where they mention that they're driven by emotion uh, that resonates with the country. And as you can see, um, the word namak salt has an emotional connotation in the Indian context. Eating salt loosely translates to aapka namak khaya hai, which implies one's loyalty to one to a, to a person or community. And the brand with its uh, tagline, Desh ka namak, kind of pays homage to and also kind of circulates the whole idea of uh, nationalism, fidelity to the nation. And um, while this paper is a part of my wider, a wider research project, I welcome constructive feedback and comments. I would, however, be failing in my duty as a scholar if I fail to acknowledge that this paper does not touch upon the politics of salt and caste in India, which is something that I'm still exploring. And these are some snippets that I managed to find where after roti salt meal, another shocker from UP, uh, Uttar, uh, that is Uttar Pradesh, uh, which is in the heartland of uh, India, uh, as students bring own plates to avoid eating with Dalits. And uh, this comes at a very uh, timely uh, uh, this thing because today the results of the elections were announced and uh, we again have a, 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 not, a, a, a like a Hindu, a Hindu a militant Hindu uh, party winning the elections today. And yeah, so with the conflict between high caste Hindus and Dalits, this takes on a very political connotation. And then there's this report from 2010 uh, with the tagline, Dalits are marching ahead in Uttar Pradesh, where uh, their marching ahead is summed up or actually measured what they eat. And uh, there's this snippet. Meanwhile, Dalit consumption of packaged salt Elaichi, which is cardamom and tomatoes, has shot up, implying that uh, they are getting access or they are buying something which was uh, until then or until now has been uh, uh, within the range of the upper caste Hindus and the upper caste people. The two texts featured here are written by upper caste men writers and the engagement with caste is also tokenistic. So I'll end with um, one uh, snapshot from caste politics and salt uh, from the Goya Journal, where uh, Vinil Baby Paul, a PhD candidate uh, who works on a linguistic caste hierarchy, mentions that uh, the outcasts in Kerala would have their uh, tongues cut if they were to say the word uppu or salt and they had to say another word in lieu of salt, which is pulichitan. Uh, my pronunciation might be wrong, but yes, so this kind of also hints at uh, the caste politics and the, the salt, uh, salt as a commodity. And I'll end with a small poem by uh, Meena Kandasamy, a uh, Dalit poetess, who wrote this poem after Sylvia Plath's daddy. And it's, it's a 
big poem, but uh, I've just put this up here where she writes that trash is long overdue. You need a thorough review. You are tax-free salt, stimulated our wounds. We're gonna sue you, the Congress shoe. So kind of also hints at the many sentiments around Gandhi and the salt satyagraha, which is something that I'm also exploring and I look forward to engaging with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sona. That, that was also a fascinating paper. Um, and I'm sure